Hello, Soccer 1010 students. Welcome to week 10 of the course. So this week we're focusing on media and popular culture, which is um, hopefully quite timely since all of us are watching a record amount of news media, or at least have been over the last few weeks, most likely. So today we can talk about it. Um, so I'm going to be discussing this lecture or presenting this lecture in three parts. First, I'll speak to you about culture and especially popular culture, and then we'll move on to the media. And then finally, media effect, which uh, is essentially a way of understanding the impact of the media and what it all means. And so um, I won't dwell on popular culture for too long, just because we have already focused on culture in a number of different ways in this course. So that's already something that you have some grounding in, but I'll just revisit some, some kind of key points around culture to um, refresh your memory. I'm sure by this time of semester, we all need a bit of a refresher on <laughs> quite a lot of the material. So um, culture in the broadest sense refers to the beliefs, values, behavior, material objects that all come together to form our way of life the way that we're living our lives. And culture has a really strong hand in shaping the way that we view the world around us. It is also a part of our, as we would say, cultural heritage. So it's something that includes the traditions and ways of life that are passed on intergenerationally. So we can talk about the culture of a certain ethnic group, for instance, if you remember talking about race and ethnicity in week eight, um, culture was a huge part of defining ethnicity as a social rather than you know, biological or appearance based category. So we can think of culture as the totality of our shared language, our shared knowledge, material objects, even our behavior. It's a very encompassing concept um, in a lot of ways. So, but it's important to, to be clear that culture itself is a very broad concept, but if we're talking about popular culture, then that's something a bit more specific. Um, so just to bring it back to some of the ideas about culture that we've spoken about so far, and um, I'll just kind of flag here as well that we'll be speaking very briefly about Bourdieu again. So that's probably, well, Bourdieu is probably the, the main theorist of culture that we've been covering in this course. So his work is of course relevant here and you can probably see the influence of his work echoed in the divide that I'm putting forward here. So if we're thinking about ways in which we can classify culture, there we can divide if between high culture and what we can think of as popular culture, which we're focusing on today. So high culture is the type of culture that's associated with you know, high amounts of cultural capital in Bodu's lexicon. So this consists of things that we would think of as being very highbrow, Things like classical music, opera, ballet, live theatre, um, anything that is usually patronised by these elite audiences, the members of the upper middle class, the upper class, those that have the time and money, but also the cultural knowledge and the background to appreciate and enjoy these things. So for instance, if you went to the opera for the first time and it was something that you had never really thought about or never really wanted to do, it would perhaps be quite difficult to understand the appeal of it. You know, you have people singing strangely in a language that you, you know, most likely do not understand. It's difficult to see why that would be enjoyable without the cultural knowledge around it, without the, the context and the, you know, socialized tastes to actually appreciate it. So um, popular culture can be defined essentially in opposition to high culture or in contrast to high culture. It's, it's a kind of um, forms of culture and cultural materials that have a much wider social appeal and 
appeal to a wider variety or wider spread of the population. So uh, this is generally things that are thought to appeal to primarily members of the middle class, of the working class, the kind of broad, you know, majority population, hence the, the term popular culture. And so um, if we're thinking about the, the high culture, popular culture distinction, we can compare different ways of consuming alcohol. Um, so we have the the kind of supercar people who are spraying bottles of champagne, which we can think of as a very kind of working class, like working culture kind of way of enjoying alcohol. And we can contrast that with with these um these very kind of this sweater over the shoulder gentlemen who are appreciating the wine and you know looking at the different uh, color notes and all of those sorts of things and we can contrast that again with um our our kind of made up here who has the the kind of wine with a straw hat kind of thing which doesn't look too bad. <laughs> So these are essentially the same product, but represented differently in different forms of cultural expression, high culture versus a kind of popular culture. So popular culture products are generally designed to appeal to as many people as possible. But the irony of this is that roughly around 80% of the products of mass culture are rejected by people. So a lot of the popular culture products that are marketed to this kind of, you know, consumer base of popular culture don't really land. They don't really hit the mark, um, which I think is quite interesting. For an example of that, you can think of any, any movie that's flopped. So movies that are made directly to appeal to a wide consumer base. So we can think of things like the, the Marvel Universe, for instance. I think those movies have done quite well, but uh, these attempts to kind of cash in on popular franchises and you know, to, to make movies not as a form of artistic expression as such, but predominantly to you know, tick a number of boxes that will allow them to appeal to this particular consumer base. Um, so it's quite interesting that even those types of efforts um, to make you know, very appealing products don't always work or at least don't appeal in this broad way that they're intended to. So um, what we can see from that is that there's not necessarily any universal standard or selection criteria of what will actually sell well, and so um, we have this this continual hunt for for things that will you know be the next popular culture item, things that will you know appeal to the consumer base of popular culture. Um, even to the extent that you know, starting in the nineteen nineties, we we had marketing um, experts who were termed kind of cool hunters or trend hunters who would go out into the world and try to find the, the kind of latest um, you know, cool item or trend that could then be you know, mass produced and translated into these, um, these kind of mass products and marketed as you know, a, a popular culture item. Um, a more contemporary version of this is the, um, the massive amounts of data that is collected by many of our, um, our favourite websites, such as the, the good old Facebook, which is always a great example of those types of things. Um, and so this type of information can be collected to see what types of things people like. So it's, you know, gathered for information on people and then that type of information is, is used in a second way to, to try to target advertising, to try to figure out you know, rather than trying to market kind of popular culture products to everyone, there's an effort to try to market them in you know, more niche kind of ways. So I think uh, 
new forms of media, which we'll be talking about a bit later today, are a really interesting development in in the kind of manufacturing of popular culture. And so um, popular culture is really for many people a whole kind of way of life. Um, it encompasses customs, rituals, pastimes and pleasures, um, and it it includes not just the direct products that we consume, things like music, fashion, TV, films, uh, video games, but also things that we we do in our day to day lives and activities that we enjoy. So, a really prominent example of this, especially in Australia, and I think something that a lot of people are are missing, is watching sport. So, we can see. Um, there are there are so many efforts to get the rugby and the football season started again and to get special exemptions for the players so that they can do full contract um, training, which I believe they're now able to do in Victoria um, because, well, partly because there's the need for the the clubs to con- and the leagues to continue to be financially viable so that they will exist again next year. But there's also, you know, a tremendous appetite amongst the Australian population for for watching televised sport, for consuming this particular type of popular culture. And we can think of like the um, the ways of life that evolve around this. So I know that um, Newcastle is a bit more of a, a kind of rugby town, but being from Melbourne, it was all about AFL and you know, growing up, you would have these divides between you know, fans of different um, football clubs. And I remember one of the first football games I went to as an adult, I went along with my partner's family who were uh, very long-term Carlton supporters. And when we went to watch the game, the first thing they did was put a beanie and a scarf on me that were Carlton colours. And I was suddenly... You know, converted to being a Carlton supporter because that was the only way to join that particular family, apparently. So you know, we can see uh, popular culture in that way. Sport really encompasses, you know, beyond just being something we consume, it's something that you know, affects the way that we socialise, affects cultural forms of belonging. Um, another another example of this, which is quite quite relevant for Australian popular culture is the consumption of alcohol. So we've already looked at the example of different representations of alcohol in in high culture versus popular culture, but we can think about the the kind of space that alcohol occupies in our cultural imaginary, the way in which different types of alcohol are associated with different types of people and become an aspect of one's identity um we can also we can think about the way in which alcohol becomes central to the ways that we socialize with each other it's called a a kind of social lubricant for a reason it's part of you know the knockoff drink kind of ritual or you know the ritual of going to the pub and having some beers and such. And I think, again, um, now that we're not able to do that in the same way, we can see that people are really missing it. There's a lot of um, a lot of questions about why cafes are allowed to open with the the maximum of 10 people in them at present, but pubs are not because people are really missing their pubs. And so, yeah, um, I think All of the points that I'm making here are really intended to to drive home the overall point that popular culture is not just about products being marketed to us. It's not just about consuming products. Yes, that's a part of it, but it's also about identities and ways of life. So, you know, popular culture, just because it is, you know, pop culture, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily meaningless it's something that's very very central to you know how we identify ourselves how we relate to each other the assumptions that we make about people by looking at them and seeing you know what are they wearing what are they doing who are they supporting 
and all of those sorts of things. So it is very central to the ways in which we socialize and the ways in which we see the world. That's why it's of such interest to sociologists. It's something very social. And so um, probably needless to say, popular culture really encompasses a lot. It encompasses just about everything. Um, we can see so many of the things that we come across in our day-to-day -day life translated into popular culture. Um, so I think a good example of this, which I'll switch forward to here, is this very interesting case of the periodic table appearing in popular culture and thus being a symbol of this kind of nerdy type of coolness. So um, I thought that was a bit fun. And so just to, to come back to one of our central figures for the course, especially on all things culture and taste, um, we can come back to this very famous quote from Bourdieu that taste classifies the classifier. Ugh, I've stuffed that up. Taste classifies and it classifies the classifier. Social subjects classified by their classifications distinguish themselves by the distinctions they make between the beautiful and the ugly, between the distinguished and the vulgar, in which process their position in the objective classification is expressed or betrayed. So put, put much more simply, your cultural tastes essentially give away your social background. So the, the notion that taste classifies the classifier, it really means that the things that we we view as being good and desirable versus, you know, vulgar or boring or, you know, uninteresting or trashy. Our, our taste in those sorts of things, they tell, they tell us so much more than just, you know, what we like and what we dislike. They tell us so much about our own social background. So for Bourdieu, that would be the, the types of cultural capital that you have. Um, that would be your habitus, the, the kind of embodied lived history that you bring into the world with you and that gives you a lens through which to view the world. So um, I think Bourdieu's work is very, very relevant for what we're focusing on today. So um, hopefully that is a, a helpful kind of crash course and reminder of what we mean when we're talking about culture in this particular course. And so I'll, um, I'll, I'll move on in the next section of this lecture to speak a bit about the media, but I'll leave this section here for now.